can make our way up to our feet at this time. Come on, let's give Jesus the highest praise this morning. Come on.
here to surrender to you Cause you're worthy of it all You love with no reservation And you're not looking for perfection There's no need in me pretending I'll give you everything I'll give you everything You deserve my full attention Nothing less than my devotion Oh, speak to me and I will listen I'll give you everything I'll give you everything And oh, oh, oh You can have my heart You can have my heart Set me free from selfish motives Oh, search me till there's nothing hidden I'll give you everything I'll give you everything Lift it up and oh. your blood, Lord, and my heart is yours forever. I belong to you, yeah, my heart is yours forever. Let's sing it to him this morning. My heart is yours forever. Not just some, we give it all. And my heart is yours forever. My heart is yours forever. You want my heart? Give you all my heart. You got it. You got it. You got it. If you want my heart, you got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. If you want my heart, you got it. You got it. You got it. If you want my heart, you got it. You got it. You got it. If you want my heart, you got it. You got it. You got it, but you got it. If you want my heart, but you got it, but you got it. Hey, you got it. If you want my heart, you got it, you got it, but you got it. If you want my heart, but you got it.
heart is yours forever Paid for by your blood, my heart is yours forever Won't you just lift our hands, lift our hearts in this place My heart is yours forever It doesn't end in this life, it's eternal My heart is yours forever My heart is yours I refuse to bow to idols My heart is yours My heart is yours forever I'm all yours, I'm all yours My heart is yours forever Hey, if you want my heart And if you want my heart You got it, you got it You got it, if you want my heart you got it, you got it, hey, you got it, if you want my heart, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. if you want my heart, you got Let's it. Sing that one more time, oh. oh, oh, oh. on yours today you can have my heart oh you can have my heart you can have it all you can have it all Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire will do Cause nothing else could take your place I feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are near Help me know you by the blood so you draw me close draw me close to you never let me go I lay it all down again just to hear you say I'm your friend You're my desire Cause you are my desire Yes, you are, Lord No one else will do Nothing else can take your place Nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your grace Help me find the way
that I read this morning I want to share with you. It says this in Psalms 89, verses 7. It says, The highest angelic power stand in awe of God. He is far more awesome than all who surround his throne. Oh, just think about that. The Bible says that God is just far more awesome than all of his surroundings, all of heaven, all of the angels. Just no, we, we think about angels and we think about beauty. We think about heaven and it's like there's no place like heaven. It's going to be awesome. But the Bible says that God and is, is the person of God, who he is, is far more awesome than all the other stuff. And sometimes we can just get so messed up in life and we start looking to all these other lesser things than God. We get caught up in all these things that try to, to get our attention with entertainment or when it comes to even the beauty of nature and when it comes to a new house, a new car, family even, we can get caught up in all these things that are just so less or awesome than how great our God is. And I just want to just put our attention back on God and just say, oh, he's the one that deserves all of our praise, all of our desires. We're just singing there that God, you're all that I want. You're all that I need. You're all I desire. And, and I just know that if we can really get to that place and really understand that, it would change us. That it would just put us back into alignment, the way that God has created us to be, that everything of life is about God. And so let's just pray, Lord, we just thank you for, Lord, just being able to worship you. And Lord, I just ask that you would give us clarity of vision, Lord, that we would see you for who you are, Lord, that we would see you far more awesome, Lord than anything in this life, far more awesome, Lord, than any kind of finances and any kind of materialism, far more awesome than even our husbands and wives and our kids, Lord, that we would see you far beyond everything else, Lord. Let us just see with clarity, Lord, let us fall more in love, more in awe of just the wonder that you are, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you that we get to worship you and to be with you this morning. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would just awaken us more and more to your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, give God some praise this morning. It's just incredible to me when I really just sit back and think that this God that is just so incredible wants to be with you and me today. Oh, that, that, that's incredible to, to think that God wants to encounter with us here this morning. That, you know, for us to want to encounter God would make... It, may, it just makes sense because he's just so incredible, but for God to want to encounter you this morning, it doesn't make sense to me. Now, it's just what an honor that is this morning that we can come into the presence of God, that he wants us to be there more than we want to be in there ourselves. And so let's just take a moment. Let's just you know, give a, a, an applause to our first and second time guests with us this morning. It's great to have you here with us, and if you just take a moment sometime during the service, there's a Get Connected card in the seat pocket in front of you, or you can take one right out of the seat uh, by, that you're sitting in, and just fill this out, and at the end of the service in the lobby, we have a VIP uh, table that you can take this and, and turn it into, and if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, we have a free Ascent Church uh, coffee mug for you, or you can take, uh, also there's the option of some coffee. And then if you're a second time guest with us, we're going to send you a free $10 Chick-fil-A gift card in the mail. Just saying thank you. And uh, we just hope that you just keep on coming back and become a, a, a part of the family here at Ascent Church. And uh, at this time, we're just going to take a moment, look around to the people that you didn't come to church with, give them a wave, give them an ear high five, tell them how good they look from a distance. And we'll start in just a moment. All right. 
right. Well, listen, as you are getting yourself uh, checked in here at Ascent Church on your smartphone, we want to just remind you of what you're doing today. Uh, and You are actually helping kids in third world countries to be able to have shoes. How many of you ever gone out without your shoes and you were just wishing, man, I wish I had my shoes on? Maybe it was the summer, it was hot asphalt, or maybe it was some stones and rocks at a beach, and you're like, ah, 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 you're just trying to walk. But you know what? For every 10 check-ins, I believe it is, you're providing a pair of shoes. So uh, every 10 check-ins provides a pair of shoes for a child. So we could today do at least 10 pairs of shoes, maybe 20 pairs of shoes, helping kids in third world countries be able to have something that we know is a basic necessity of life as we walk around, we forget about it, especially in a day like today, man. I can't even imagine being outside without shoes and some thick socks as well. Well, we're very saddened uh, today because this was the week that Carmen Licardella went home to be with the Lord. And uh, we're going to show his picture here. He passes away their lifelong addiction to Jesus. If you're going to be addicted to someone or something, how about being addicted to Jesus? Doesn't that sound great? He's the one who came up with the concept of addiction to Jesus. And uh, his last words were, Satan, bite the dust. Come on, somebody. Isn't that great? Let's put our hands together for a life well lived, a uh, man of God that I personally knew and I remember a number of years ago, I'd say it's 15 years ago, I had one of my secretaries telling me, Carmen was on the phone. I go, don't play games with me. I, you know, I'm busy. And she calls back. She goes, no, I'm telling you, Carmen is on the phone. They were very, very excited. And I uh, finally got on the phone, and the guy's like, yo, pastor. And uh, so I knew it was Carmen because nobody else says yo like that. And, and he says, I, I need you to uh, do me a favor. He says, my niece is in your city. She lives in Westlake or Bay Village, I think it was. And she's, she's shacked up with this idiot, and uh, she wants to break out of this relationship. And, and uh, I'm going to give you $20,000 if you'll help me. Just, if you could hire her at the church. She's got skills. She's, you know, she'll be a great receptionist. She's a beautiful lady. She's a big smile and all this. And uh, I said, well, I do got to meet her, you know. And he says, that's fine. I understand. And, and he says, but I have the, the money within a few days. And he did, $20,000. He basically paid her to work for us. She broke up with the yo-yo. And uh, she ended up marrying one of the guys in the church. And it's just a wonderful story. And Carmen became one of my good friends. He, he uh, and I talked hours on the phone. And uh, he came here to preach one Sunday. And when Carmen... <laughs> came to preach before the service. He goes, uh, listen, he goes, I only have a 20-minute anointing. I go, what's that? And he says, I can only preach for 20 minutes, and then I got to sing because I'm just no good after 20 minutes. So I said, okay, well, do your 20-minute anointing. I just, I'll never forget it. He had a 20-minute anointing, and uh, you can't be a pastor if you only have a 20-minute anointing, that's for sure. But nevertheless, Carmen came here, did a concert for us, and, you know, let's just give a big hand to the Lord for giving us Carmen. And uh, let's all live better lives because of the re example. Listen, one of the things that he told me that was most important in his whole life was he goes, I've won over a million souls to God. That's my claim to fame, winning a million souls to God. Let's all do that ourselves. Let's be soul winners and sharing Jesus wherever we go. Well, listen, uh, talking about sharing Jesus, uh, celebrate recovery is definitely in that vein. And I know Carmen would be very much behind this. We are starting a ministry. It's going to be a big, big deal. It's probably the big deal of the whole year, 2021. It's called Celebrate Recovery. If you'd like to be involved with this, you say, you know what? I like to help people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol and, uh, you know, gambling, pornography, what have you. We've got uh, people that are hurt. They're going through divorce. It hurts hangups and habits. If people have that, and most people do, they are more than uh, – invited to be here and welcome to be here we're going to have folks from outside this uh church coming in droves and i really looking for a team of people that are ministry minded they got a heart for helping people to you know get their lives back on track and maybe you've gone through a whole lot and you've said you know what i'd like to give back i'd like you to join me i'm going to be here personally on wednesday night at 5 30. you got to come through the back church entrance here at the office can't go through the front but at 5 30 to 6 30 we have one hour meeting and bethel church in Brunswick is teaming up with us. They find out what we're doing, and they're bringing some people over. And it's going to be right here at our site. They said, we want to be a part of this. We want to partner with you. And 
House of Praise sending over their pastor, Pastor Mark. They're teaming up with us. So there's something big that's brewing here, and I, I want to invite you to be a part of it this Wednesday at 5.30 p.m., and we'll serve you some food as well. Uh, those of you that are married, uh, the marriage conference is this uh, Wednesday. I'm sorry, not that's this Wednesday. It's this Friday and Saturday, Friday night, one night only, and it's $119 only in the beautiful uh, Berlin Hotel that's called the Encore Hotel. And, you know, I'm just telling you, this is exciting. We have 30 people, and it's climbing. There's a lot of folks that are coming on board, and uh, this conference is going to be probably uh, like a, a really amazing conference. Uh, the speakers sure are, and it's Judge and Lori Brown. I'd say they're the finest of TCT television, and they're amazing. They're kind of like in a middle age, so they're going to be able to relate to folks that are older and folks that are younger. They're right in there. Been married 22 years, have four or five kids. I'm not sure which, but anyway, great, great people, great conference. I want to encourage you to get signed up today. Pastor Patty's going to be in the back with some others in the lobby, and uh, welcome her family here. Her family is coming all the way from West Virginia to church. Some of you thought you came a long way. They drove all the way from West Virginia yesterday to come here to church this morning, and they'll be here all week. We're looking forward to that, and maybe we can get them to come to the marriage conference as well and uh, work on their marriage of 99 years. Now, how long have you really been married? 60 years, 60 years. So you could teach us some things. Why don't you come and talk to us about how you made such a beautiful daughter and uh, well, all the great things that uh, you've accomplished in your life and marriage. Well, at this time, we're going to continue to worship the Lord with the giving of our tithes and Kingdom Builders offerings. And I got some really exciting stuff to share with you today in uh, the book of Chronicles, First Chronicles 29, verses 12 through 14. And uh, if we could throw that scripture up there, that would be great. First Chronicles. Maybe we don't have that scripture. I'll get it here. First Chronicles chapter 29. Okay. And verses... 12 through 14. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I, who are my people, that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Here's the thought. Every time we give to God, we're giving back to our supplier. God's not just a resource in our life, but he's the source. So we are owners of nothing, and we're stewards of everything. So everything you think you have, your house, your car, you know, your 401k, whatever, that's God's. Everything's God's. Cattle of a thousand hills are God's. The farmer thinks it's theirs, but they're God's. The gold and the silver are mine, says the Lord. They're all God's. The bitcoins, they're God's. They're all God's. You know what I'm saying? And God can bring over to whoever he wants, whenever he wants, whatever he wants. And so when, when David is giving to the Lord literally billions of dollars, and today's money, it was around $90 billion was the Temple of Solomon. And David gave a good portion of it, a big portion of it, the majority of it. He raised that so that his son could build it. When he was giving that, what happened was that he, this is the scripture, he says, God, I'm just giving you what's already yours. You've given it to me to give to you. And, you know, it's kind of like God tapping you on the shoulder and saying, yes, God. And he's, he says, well, uh, I'd like you to give back some of the money and resources I've given you uh, to give back to me. And see, that's basically what he's saying. He says, God, I'm just giving you what's already yours anyway. He says, you know, you gave us the power. You gave us the strength. You gave us the wisdom. You gave us the connection. You gave us the business. You gave us the business plan. God, it's all yours anyway. But, man, it sure is a pleasure being able to work with you and to be able to be a part of your kingdom. And as we give today, let's just remember that God is our source. Amen? And it's just a blessing to be able to give back to him. The man that lived the most generous life in the world was Jesus Christ. You think about it, the most generous man. If we want to be like Jesus, let's be generous as he was. Father, thank you that you gave us such a tremendous example in Jesus Christ who gave his all. And Lord, as we give today, we give our all to you and your kingdom. And we're so excited to be 
kingdom builders here as well. Lord, help us to just advance your kingdom greatly. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Your rock I want In your rock I've ever needed Your rock I want Help me know you are near Sing your all I want Your rock I want your all I've ever needed. Your all I want. Help me know you are near. Well, Father, we just thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for everything that you've given us, Lord. We thank you that. You are so worthy of all of our hearts. You're so worthy of all of our desires, all of our life. Lord, we pour it out at your feet this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the sweet presence that's in this room right now, Lord. We pray that you would open our ears, open our hearts to receive a word that you have to speak this morning. God, we pray that it would be transformative, that it wouldn't leave with us, Lord, that we wouldn't leave it here in the church. When we leave these doors, we would just uh, allow it to impact our lives in every way, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen, amen. Can we give up for worship team John on the keys over here thank you so much well for those of you who don't know who I am my name is Pastor Tyler well it's not my name my name is Tyler uh, so I'm the youth and the children's pastor here and so if there's any young adults in the room or if you know any young adults tell them about Elevate we've got Elevate on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. shameless plug right there before I get into the message um, and, and today I want to talk about something really really important and it's not I'm talking to singles and I'm talking to people that are dating uh, this morning but I I want you to know that there is something in here for everybody in this room. I'm talking this morning on the universal power of purity. Purity. Because the world gives us a different definition, though, of what purity actually means. And sometimes even Christians give us a different definition than what the Bible gives us. And so um, before I talk about that, I, I want to tell a story really quick. So for those of you who have ever heard me talk, I always talk about my three brothers. And growing up with three younger brothers, we always had the, the most crazy stories. That's how I have so many stories to tell every, every time I, I speak. It's like a different story because my brothers were all crazy and I was crazy. And we got crazy together when you mixed us in. And so there's this one time on the rare occasion, one of the rare occasions my parents left us home alone. Ever say, uh-oh. One of the rare occasions my parents left us at home. I was probably like 10 years old. Um, the reason they left us home alone is because we ruined every babysitter they've ever tried. <laughs> Even my cousin, my cousin refused to babysit us. She tried one time, we all, you know, we just, we locked ourselves in a room and she's trying to get in and we ran away and it was, it was a disaster. So they stopped even trying to get us into babysitting. And, but anyways, we were home alone and, and we did some fun stuff together. And so one of the things that we did was we had a cooking competition. And we didn't burn the house down, okay? Spoiler alert. You know, we weren't using the stove, we were using a toaster. Our, our competition was to see who could make the best cinnamon toast. Has anybody ever had cinnamon toast before? Oh my Jesus, I feel his presence. Oh, if you don't know what cinnamon toast is, cinnamon toast is, is you put the bread on the toast, you get the toast, you put the butter on there right away so it gets all melty, and then you take the perfect combination of cinnamon and sugar and you sprinkle it over there. I like to give it like two or three layers of cinnamon sugar, and it's just like, it's just heaven on bread. I mean, it's, 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 it's glorious. It's absolutely amazing. And so we had this competition, and, and two of my brothers did it normally, and, and me and my younger brother did it a little bit different. I added some chocolate to mine. I used, like, a cheese grater, and I grated some chocolate. I didn't think it was that bad of an idea. A lot of people here maybe think that chocolate makes everything better. But uh, my youngest brother did something a little bit more crazy. He went to the spice cabinet. And he's about, he's two years younger than me, two or three years younger than me, and so... He's probably eight at this time. And he goes to the spice cabinet and he reaches up and he just grabs the most colorful things he could find. They look fantastic. Like, and so he, he gets the cinnamon toast. He puts the butter and cinnamon sugar because that's the basics. That's the pure cinnamon toast. And so he reaches up and starts grabbing spices out of this cabinet. And the first thing he grabs is garlic powder. And he sprinkles some garlic powder on there. He has no clue what these things taste like. Okay, and, and then he grabs some cumin because it's got a really nice color to it, and some paprika, because that's really bright, and it looks really good against the, the brown cinnamon, and, 
And it's this masterpiece. It looks amazing to the eyes. But let me tell you, it only took one of us to taste it. It only took one of us to taste it. One of my brothers actually tasted it, and he ran to the bathroom and immediately vomited. It was, it was absolutely disgusting. Their face was distorted. I didn't have the guts to taste it. I'm sorry to tell you. I didn't have the boldness to be able to taste this, this nasty concoction. So pure cinnamon toast is, is what is good. When something is pure, it means to be unmixed. Everybody say unmixed. The definition of purity that I, that I found on the internet is this, is freedom from adulteration or contamination. Now, have you ever read a definition of a word and there's a word in there that you actually have to go and read the definition to as well? I'm like, why do you gotta do this? Why can't you use the simple words, like four letter words max? And so I looked up adulteration. I thought I knew what it meant, but this definition is like so good when it comes to understanding what purity really is. Adulteration is the action of making something poorer in quality by the addition of another substance. And so we have, you have pure cinnamon toast here that is like, absolutely amazing, sweet, it's delicious, it's crunchy, it's, it's like one of my favorite breakfasts to eat, when it's pure. But when it's adulterated, when, there's, when it's made a poorer quality by the adding of a substance that wasn't intended to go on it, 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 all of a sudden it makes you sick. And you know, when we have relationships with human beings, God has designed us to have pure relationships with one another. Pure relationships. And sometimes we adulterate our, our adult relationships. We, we adulterate our, our relationships with people, whether it's friendships, it could be dating, it could be even with your spouse. We adulterate these relationships that God has intended to be pure by adding things that don't belong. And one of the best ways to adulterate a dating relationship is adding sin. Sin does not belong in a pure relationship. And so I've got four points here, and I want to talk about today how to have an unmixed relationship because in a biblical sense the word pure means to be unmixed with the world unmixed with sin to be pure means to be solely focused on God it means to have no added ingredients okay and so the first point I have is this don't make God your third wheel I don't know if you've ever been a third wheel before but it's extremely uncomfortable it's extremely uncomfortable I remember times going to like you know we'll go to the mall and we'll walk around and and the person I was gonna hang out with didn't show up, and so I'm with the new couple, and they're kissing, making out on the bench, and I'm just like sitting there next to them, and they're making it really, really uncomfortable for me. And so being the third wheel is, is being the least relevant person in the group. Okay, so you, you know what, what, what a triangle is, okay? So you've got the two people that want to be together, and then there's you. That's the third wheel. That's the third wheel. And it's the, you're the least relevant person. They could be making out right next to you, and they you know, totally ignore you all the way to be holding hands and having conversation. You're just kind of trailing along. It's the least relevant person in a group. And many Christians make God their third wheel in their relationship. They like to have God as a common denominator, but they don't like to have him as the primary focus. A lot of Christians will say, well, I would never date somebody who's not a Christian. And that's good enough for them. But what, what, what it really means to be a Christian is to have your life given over to God. And so many Christians, including myself when I was dating, I did it so wrong. I did, I did some things right. Obviously, I found an amazing wife in Grace, and she's wonderful and she's amazing. But I did a lot of things wrong before I met Grace. And so what, what the problem is, is people, even Christians, will make God the least relevant person in their relationship. It's good that, that you're both Christians. It's good that you both go to church on Sundays. It's good that you may read your Bible. But when you're having conversation and when you're interacting together, if God is not, it's not saying that God has to be the subject of every conversation. But what I'm saying is that if God is not the focus of everything you do say and think, you're going to allow sin and worldliness to mix into your relationship. We can't afford to make God the third wheel in our relationship. He can't just be a common denominator that we share, that we both believe in God, and that's where it stays. It has to run our life. We have to be fully devoted to him. Point number two is this. Actually, I, I wanted to read a verse, sorry, before I move on. In Proverbs 3, 6, it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, say all. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. It's, it, that doesn't mean that you put God in a Sunday box. It doesn't mean that you put God in your morning box and then the rest of the day you can just do whatever you want. It means to make God the primary focus of everything you do, say, and think. He's the focus of your life. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be devoted to Christ. It's important to find somebody who will be a fuel to your fire for God, not to your fire for sin. It's really important to find somebody that will be fuel to your fire for God and not to your fire for sin. 
in past relationships, I remember I, I, try to, I would try to mix God into our relationships, which would normally be a really good thing, but for some reason it felt like this awkward piece that I was trying to force. And so I, would, I remember when I would try and, and with these you know, people that I have dated in the past, I remember sitting down and trying my hardest to read the Bible with them and talk to them about God. And I would be really excited about a specific verse or something that I read. And I'd be like, listen to this verse. How awesome is this? And they just kind of smile and nod. And, and I think it's a red flag if they have nothing to add. I think it's a red flag if they have nothing to add to your fire for God. If you are always the one trying to pull them up, they might be pulling you down. And so when I met Grace, I fell in love with Grace at a coffee shop. Like, that's really where it happened. She, she was looking down at her Bible, and I was looking over at her, and it was just like this amazing thing where I could have conversation with her about the Lord, where this this just passionate conversation about Jesus, where we would sit in our car until like 2, 3 in the morning at the church parking lot or in the Taco Bell parking lot one time, and, and we would talk about the Lord, and for once in my life, it didn't feel like this awkward peace. And I realized something. I realized that it wasn't God that wasn't fitting in. It was this other person that wasn't fitting in with me and God. And that has to be your focus when you're dating. You have to remember that you and God's relationship is primary. And if there's a piece that doesn't fit in with you and God, that piece does not belong. Does that make sense? Okay, point number two. Always remember who you belong to. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, it says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. When you purchase an item, you pay the price necessary to own it, and when you pay it, it's yours. When Jesus came and he, put, he stretched his arms out on the cross and he poured out his blood and he paid with his life to have you, you belong to him. If you're a Christian, you belong to God. And many times Christians will get into relationships where somebody is challenging that ownership, where you, they would rather you obey them than God. It's important that you're, to, to remember that your obedience and allegiance is to God and God alone. And when someone comes along and challenges that obedience and that allegiance, it's, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I'm telling you, if there's any verse that I have read in my life that I have seen play out so many times, time and time and time again, it's this one right here. Bad company corrupts good character. It's happened to me. I've been the bad company. I've had friends that have had bad company. I can't, I remember coming to this church about 11 years ago with a group of friends and over about a year's time or so, maybe two years, I watched them slowly leave the church and slowly leave the faith because of the relationships that they were having. Their relationships were challenging their ownership that actually belongs to God, and they forgot that they belong to God first, and their obedience and allegiance belongs to God first. And so it's important to remember always, it's God first that your allegiance and your ownership is to. There's a story in the Bible with Joseph. When Joseph was sold into slavery, he goes into this guy named Potiphar's house, and, and he serves so faithfully that he's raised up to this, this powerful position, and he's like the top slave in the house, and he's got all these benefits, and and Potiphar's wife starts to take a, a, a shine on him, or a shine to him. I don't know what the, what the term is. Potiphar's wife starts to have eyes for Joseph. And so she starts to seduce him. I, can, it doesn't, I don't know if it says this or not. I forget what, what, what the Bible says about the previous interactions with them. But I, I, would, I would say that she's probably made several attempts. Several attempts. And there's one time that we have recorded in the Bible where Joseph... He's wearing his cloak. He's in, you know, in the house, and he's doing his thing. He's serving with all his heart. He belongs to the Lord. His God is still his God. And Potiphar's wife comes in, and she's naked, and she's, like, trying to seduce him. And what does Joseph do? The Bible says that Joseph runs. He runs. Have you ever had to run from somebody? I'm not talking literally, but I have literally ran from people before. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding. It happened in the church parking lot. I'm not kidding. I, I, I can't explain in too much detail. I can't explain it. They're not here. They're not here. Don't worry. I would never say that, baby. It's, I just remember I had to physically run away from somebody because I knew that their, manipulate, their manipulative tactics were so strong, and I knew how weak I was, and I knew if I stayed there, they'd seduce me into staying with them when I knew that it was not what God desired for me. And so there are times where I've had to emotionally run. There's times where I've had to uh, distant, like keep a, a distance between me and somebody. And there's times where I've had to physically run away to keep myself pure, to keep myself 
for God. And so Joseph ran because he knew that he belonged to the Lord. If you have that mindset, if you have that mindset that you belong to God and God alone, when somebody comes and challenges that, your first instinct is to run. Because I believe if Joseph would have stayed, I think he ran because he wanted it. I think he ran because there was a desire there. I think he ran because he knew the danger. It wasn't like he was not repulsed. It was not like he was repulsed by her, like she was this, you know, not so good looking person. It's not like he was, you know, he didn't want this. He ran because he wanted it so bad and he knew that the only way to keep himself pure is to run from her. And even on his way out, she grabs his cloak and he runs out naked and everything. And, and when you try to leave somebody that's manipulative, they'll, they'll, dig, they'll try to dig their hooks in deeper. That's what happens when, we, when we're in manipulative relationships. And so it's important to remember who you belong to. Point number three, set boundaries up front. Boundaries are, are huge. You know, there's a place called Fort Knox. Have you ever heard of Fort Knox before? Fort Knox is home to over 50% of America's gold. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. There, there are some pretty intense security measures at Fort Knox, and I just want to read through a couple of these security measures that they have in place there. They've got landmines that lead up to the building. They've got electric fences. They've got high-caliber laser-triggered machine guns. That's pretty scary. They've got 40,000 soldiers on a nearby base, impenetrable, impenetrable walls made of granite and steel, a 22-ton blast-resistant vault door that requires a team of 10 people to unlock. I mean, that's some security, right? Because you put boundaries around things that you see as valuable. And if you don't have boundaries in your relationships, it's probably because you don't see your value. If you don't put boundaries places that you will not cross. If you don't put boundaries in your relationships, you will cross the line. And it's probably because you don't see your value. You don't see what God has paid for to purchase you, to have you, to own you. We put, we put barriers, strong security barriers, boundaries are set around valuable items. And you are so valuable that the, the eternal, omnipotent God that created the universe sent his son to die and pour out his blood. You are so valuable. It required the death and the blood of Jesus Christ to purchase you. And anybody that threatens that relationship needs to go. And there needs to be boundaries put in place. I've got a slide for this, for this next thing I'm going to say because I think it's so important. Your boundaries should be as strong as you are weak. Your boundaries should be as strong as you are weak. So you don't just put boundaries up because you see your value because you know that this is the right thing to do. You put boundaries up because you know that you're weak. Joseph had boundaries. And the problem is, is we, we like to ask the question, how far is too far? We like to justify how far we can get. And, and that question is kind of like asking, how close should I get to this cliff? And if your only line is not to have sex before marriage, I promise you, you're probably going to have sex before marriage. And not only that, but you'll have a life completely filled and overtaken with sin if you don't have boundaries set further back than that. Because every decision that you make before the line is momentum that could push you over the line. And so why not? Why not put boundaries further back that you can account for your weakness? The Bible says that the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, right? And we need to recognize that all of us have weaknesses. I remember times where, where in my life, like I said, I didn't do everything perfectly, but there were times in my life where I knew that if I would just, if all it took was for me to lay down on a couch with this young lady, and I'd be done, because I was that weak. And so there were, there were some really strong boundaries in some of my relationships that I had to put there because of how weak I really understood that I was. That strong desire kind of overtakes you, and, and the more decisions that you make, that will, they'll push you over. It's like, it's like sprinting towards the edge of the cliff and then trying to stop right before the edge. Right? There's some skid. <laughs> There's some skid. You might trip and fall, right? It happens because the boundaries are set too close to the line that actually is drawn by the Bible. And, you know, the closer you get to that line, the more you like to justify crossing it. I, I can't tell you how many times that just because I, my, my decision-making ability was clouded because of the atmospheres I put myself in, my, my decision-making ability was so clouded that I would begin to say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say that we can't do this. I mean, the Bible says you can't do this, but it doesn't say that we can't do this. I would come up with every excuse. And the person who asked the question, how far is too far, is way too eager to sin. 
that's never the question that we should be asking ourselves. It's what boundaries do I have to set in advance? Because if you try to ask the question, what are my boundaries? If you could ask the same question in two different atmospheres and get two completely different answers. If you ask what my boundaries should be in church, you're gonna get a pretty good answer. Because you're in the presence of God, you're in the presence of believers, you're in the church. It, there's, this, there's this reverence for the presence of God. If I ask myself, what should my boundaries be in my relationships? Well, you know, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this. I need to set this boundary and this boundary and this boundary because I'm weak, because I'm valuable, because God desires to have my whole heart, not just part of my heart. And if you were to ask yourself the same question, what should my boundaries be? If you ask that question in the bedroom, you're gonna, you're gonna come up with some different answers. Am I right? I mean, I've been there. I've tried, to, I've tried to set my boundaries in the heat of the moment, and I miserably failed because I, I refused to do the right thing, and I, I continually justified sin in my life because my boundaries weren't set far enough back. You know, it's not just for dating relationships either. Grace and I were just talking. She used my message against me. I, I preached this message in a uh, two-part relationship series at Elevate, and she brought this— have you ever—I mean— this is by, I think the Bible says not many of you should be teachers because you'll be judged more strictly. It's also because of your wife. Because Grace brought up some points that I spoke at at Elevate. And it was designed to speak to, to people that were dating. And, and she, would, she would talk to me about boundaries that we have to set in our marriage. Now for me, I'm a super outgoing person. I could make plans with people every night of the week, stay out till two in the morning, sleep for four hours, wake up the next day, be completely fine. Because I'm, an, I'm a super extrovert, like I love it, I thrive on it. But Grace's love language is quality time. And so there has to be boundaries if I want a healthy marriage. And so we talked that night, we talked about, you know, how many nights a week should I make plans? How many nights a week should we stay home and do whatever she wants to do? It's important to set boundaries, not just boundaries for time, but boundaries should also exist in marriage because just because you're married doesn't mean you can't do impure things. There could be external communications with people outside of your union. There could be things that if your spouse knew would make them extremely uncomfortable. And so it's important to set boundaries in our marriages just as much as it is important to set boundaries in our dating relationships. Amen? In 1 Peter 5, Eight, it says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a, a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. It says, be alert and of sober mind. You know what kills sobriety? Fulfilling those desires. When I get in an atmosphere that I know I shouldn't be in, when I begin to cross those lines, my sobriety, my decision-making ability is completely corrupted. Now, I just went hunting for the first time in the fall, this past fall, with my father-in-law. And we were up in the tree stand, and it's like remarkably hard to hunt. I didn't realize how hard it was. You know, I, I see pictures of people on Facebook luring deer in with apples and they're just eating out of their hands. It's not like that in the woods. You know, deer are extremely skittish. If I blinked the wrong way, this, this, this deer would sprint in the other direction. It was intense. It was difficult. But there's one thing, there's a weakness that bucks have. And my father-in-law would tell me that he, he would drip pheromones of a female deer in heat. And he would drip them around the area that we were aiming at because the buck smells it from a distance, the wind blows that scent around and the buck smells it and he runs over to that area and he's looking for it and he's smelling it and it gives a perfect shot for a hunter in a tree stand. And so I remember some, one time my, my father-in-law told me about a story where he was with some guy and they were dripping pheromones around and he got some on himself. This story blew my mind because I don't think I've ever heard anything like this before in my life. The buck comes in to the area, and he starts to sniff around, and he starts to try and climb the tree. I'm not kidding. I don't care how hairy you are. I don't care if you have hooves. You know, you have a scent that is not like a deer scent. This buck loses all sensibility because of its strong desires. And the devil does the same thing. The devil is sitting in a tree stand right now, dripping pheromones over here, dripping pheromones over here, tempting you over here, tempting you over there. And if he can lure you in to cross a few lines, he can take aim and take a shot at your life. He roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That is not, that is not a, uh, a, a, an unscary term, like that is a frightening term, that the devil can devour me if I put myself in certain positions. We need to remember to set boundaries up front. Boundaries should be as strong as we are weak. In Hebrews 12, 1, 
it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin. Now, when I had read this verse before so many times, this, Hebrews is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's like, it's amazing. I've read this verse so many times, and I used to think it said, if you would ask me what this verse said, I'd say every weight of sin. But it says every weight and sin, which tells me there are some things that aren't sinful that are weights. And if you're, if you're dating somebody, if you're in a relationship with somebody who does not have the focus of the Lord in their life, if they, if they are not true Christians, if they're not willing to not only support their relationship with God, but your relationship with God, they're dead weight, they're spiritual dead weight. I remember, I've dated so much spiritual dead weight. I've been spiritual dead weight where all I do is I drag somebody down. I never push them towards God. I always drag them slowly away from God. It's important to cast off every weight and sin because some weight will lead to sin. Some people are spiritual dead weight that you need to just get out of your life. In point four, my final point says this. Always remember, God is love. Love is not God. Our culture has it backwards. Our culture has made love God. And if you make love God, morality gets real cloudy. Because you can say that just because I have an emotional connection, a sexual connection with somebody, it will justify. And anything that I desire out of that emotional connection all of a sudden becomes pure because of love. That's making love God. The problem with making love God is you don't have the character of true love. But the Bible says that God is love. And because God is love, we have a great, amazing picture of what real love actually looks like. There's a very clear definition of what love is because the Bible says that God is love. When God is love, true morality is clear. But when love is God, true morality is distorted. In 1 Corinthians 13, if we could have John, could you come up? That'd be awesome. In 1 Corinthians 13, Verses 4 through 8 says this, love is patient and kind. Now, we've heard this, this whole passage probably over 200 times in our life. They read it at every wedding. You know, you read it all the time. Like, this is, this is such a well-known verse, a, a couple of verses, a passage. And it's important to know this passage. It's important to know God because if you don't know what real love is, you'll be fooled by the counterfeit. And there are people in your life that, if you're with the wrong person, if you're dating the wrong person, they'll, they'll give you a counterfeit love that's really tempting, but it's not true. It's tempting, but it's not true. And I just want to go through this verse. It says, love is patient and kind. So love is patient, meaning love can actually wait. If you're with a person right now that is refusing to wait till marriage to have sexual relations, not just that. I think the world, I think the Christian community has done, has done people a disservice by making the line, don't have sex before you're married, because there's so much more to purity. Purity is not just about not having sex until you're married. Purity is about being unmixed with the world, being fully devoted to God. So if love is actually patient and you're with a person that may be rushing you, or you feel, you feel pressured to do things that may not be actual love. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Let me tell you about people's insisting. Like, it's dangerous. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. You know, there's a story in the Bible where there's this guy who, who has such intense lust for this woman that he, he says that he loves her, and, and the Bible says that he goes and he sleeps with this woman, and immediately afterwards, what he thought was love, he realized was actually lust. Because the Bible says after he slept with this woman, he had hatred for her in his heart. Because true love never ends. True love never ends. And lust is not love. Lust never leads to love. You can't start with lust and end with love. Lust is selfish. Love is selfless. And it's so important that in our relationships, we need to set aside lust as, as much as we possibly can. Set those boundaries. And remember that who we belong to. We belong to the Lord of hosts. We belong to the God of of the universe. We belong to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. And so I just want to read through these points one more time really quick, just so that they're fresh. Don't make God your third wheel. Make sure that God is not the least relevant person in your relationship. That goes for singles, goes for people dating, goes for marriages. Point number two, always remember who you belong to. We belong to the Lord. 
Point number three, set boundaries up front. You set boundaries around things that are valuable. Your boundaries should be as strong as you are weak. And point number four, always remember, God is love. Love is not God. So if we could just have everybody in this place, just close your eyes and bow your heads. I just want to ask two questions. There's two things I want to ask. And the first one is this. If you, if you believe that you, you've been doing this wrong, you've been doing the wrong thing, and you want to commit your life and your relationships to the Lord, it might be your marriage where you feel like you've been off, where God has become your third wheel, where God is just this background thing where you go to church together, you hold hands, but you don't actually have this spiritual connection with your spouse. It might be that you're dating somebody who has no interest in God. If you're in this place and you want to give your relationship, not just your heart, but your relationship over to the Lord to have control, to do it the right way, to do it God's way, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. Awesome. And there's one more group of people I want to talk to this morning. It's the group that, that maybe has never given their life to the Lord before. Or maybe you're in this place and you've given, you know, you've gone to church all your life, you've heard the messages, you've, you've experienced the worship, and you may have even had an encounter with God, but you, you've walked away and you've set your relationship with God aside. And he's, he's not your focus anymore. You don't love God as much as you did before. If that's you and you want to give your life fully over to the Lord this morning, I want to tell you that the greatest gift is not being married, it's not having this perfect dating relationship, it's not having all the freedom in the world as a single person, the, the greatest gift you could ever receive is a relationship and salvation from Jesus Christ. And so if that's you, if you want to give your life to the Lord, you want to follow him for the rest of your life, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. I'm going to ask one more time. If you're in this place right now and you, you know that you've walked away from God, you're, if you were to walk out of here right now and you, you would got in a car accident, what would happen? Where would you go? Are you sure? If you're not sure where you're going, you don't have a, a, a vibrant, loving relationship with Jesus Christ, but you want that, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. I see your hands. All right, we're just going to say a quick prayer. So if everybody could keep their heads bowed and their eyes closed. As a family, let's repeat this prayer after, after me. And remember that the prayer is not the thing that saves us. It's not this clever craftiness of our words. It's the Lord that saves us. So speak it to the Lord. So just keep your eyes closed and focus your heart on Jesus. And repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I thank you. You gave your life for me. You showed me my value is found in you and you alone. I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, and make me whole. Make me perfect in the eyes of my Father. From this day forward, I give my life to you, my relationships to you, my everything to you. And I ask you to walk with me and help me to know you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Can we give these guys a round of applause? Awesome. Awesome. So happy for you guys. Well, thank you guys so much. Dr. Paul is going to come up and say something really quickly, but I just wanted to thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It's so good to be in the house of God with other believers. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you. Hey, didn't Tyler do a great job here on Single Sunday? And uh, I mean, I really enjoyed this message, and we're going to pray for everyone that is single before we leave here today. But I want to just say this. As you got, came in today, did you get the word for today? Hopefully everybody did. If you didn't, I have some here, and there's others in the back. We want to make sure you get them. I got a letter, and this is not all that unusual, uh, about the word for today. I mean, people are really being impacted by these devotionals, and I just want to have you see this as more than just something for yourself, but something for, for others as well. I know Mark and Jennifer Bush, they probably take five of them. There's quite a few of them, and they hand them out to people. And there's others of you that you see this as a, you know opportunity to reach someone else in your sphere of influence, your workplace, or wherever it might be. But here's this letter. Uh, <clears throat> it says, um, as I was reading the word for today, I thought I should write to you in the church. I noticed the words at the bottom of page 31. If you enjoy the devotional, please let us know. So I want to let you know that I have never written a letter like this before in my life, and also that no other devotion has ever held my interest the way that yours has. I look forward to reading it each and every day. 
This is the second issue that I've been blessed to have. The first one I received, the chaplain handed to me as he was entering the building where I live in the facility. The second one I asked one of the people he works closely with to be sure that I get one if she ran across another. All that to say, I actively sought it out and appreciate every single word in the way that these Bible-based teachings have affected my life. I find every day's devotion encouraging in a very honest and loving way. Your words are beautiful, and I feel they are straight from God. And uh, Teresa is very, very appreciative. So these devotions are getting into people's workplace. They're sometimes, I know, a chiropractor that puts them out you know, in his lobby. And I just want to encourage you, think about somebody at work, think about somebody maybe in your neighborhood, a pre-Christian in your life that you've been sowing seeds with. Let's go ahead and, and pass these out because we get enough for at least everybody to have one extra to be able to minister to somebody else. So as you're going today, keep that in mind. But let's go ahead and pray for all those that are single. If you're single, please stand to your feet. And we just want to pray a blessing over you, encouragement over you. I think about third of our church is single. You guys are single, Owen. I'm just trying to remind you that are single to stand up. Okay. All right. We got everybody that's single. Okay, good. Father, we just thank you for every single single here today. And Lord, we just know that our, our lives are not about just finding someone to be uh, married to, Lord. And that is a wonderful blessing, but it's really about serving you and being married to you and being in right relationship with you. And God, I just pray encouragement for every single person, Lord, that God, you will guide them. Their lives are important. Whether they're married or single, you have great things for them. And I just pray that, Lord, you will show them, uh, God, uh, who they are to spend their time with, Lord, and what kind of relationships that they should invest in and which ones they should run from. Lord, we thank you for this great encouraging message today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Pastor Jordan is going to wrap up next Sunday. He's going to be uh, talking about relationships in general. You're going to love it. Uh, we'll see you. Uh, God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled day.